My name is Gabriel Chapman. I work for NetApp. I am a senior manager for our cloud infrastructure business unit. Um, came to NetApp via acquisition via SolidFire. I've worked at Cisco, I've worked at SimpliVity, I've worked at Emulex, and I was an end user and a almost honorary tech field day delegate until I joined, I joined Emulex like the week before the invite went out. So I never got to be a delegate, but I presented to Tech Field Day on a number of occasions. So I kind of feel like I'm, I'm part of the crew. Um, today, what we do want to talk about is, um, you know, obviously hyper-converged infrastructure is a big market. It's been a viable space here now for the last five or six years. It's a growing business. It's a billion dollar run rate business. We've seen successful IPOs of Nutanix. We've seen acquisitions by SimpliVity and SpringPath. We've seen a whole host of software defined storage companies come into the market and kind of co-op some of the messaging. And we've seen the larger orgs either purchase or start to develop their own technology. So NetApp kind of falls into that, um, you know, new to the game. Um, actually, it's going to be our one year birthday. Uh, NetApp HCI birthday will come on October 27th. So. And we're almost a real boy. Um, <clears throat> what I do want to talk to you today, though, is I see a difference in a shift in this particular market going away from what we would consider traditionally hyper-converged to more of a hybrid cloud type model as we start to see these things become more robust, more cloud-like in their consumption aspects, more focused on not just putting the pieces of the puzzle together and delivering that in a turnkey solution, but how do we integrate with the public cloud providers? How do we build services? How do we accelerate the journey to DevOps and cloud within an on-prem uh, facility, right? So that's kind of where we're gonna go with this today. Um, <clears throat> I'll do some, you know, some, um, some background stuff here because I think the, uh, there gets to be some confusion about what things are. Right? We need to understand architectural choices and decisions around why things are done. Um, I start, you know, I found this uh, uh, on Twitter of all places. Uh, what is a sandwich, right? It's bread and, and stuff in between the bread, right? It's lettuce and tomatoes, and if you're like me, it's a BLT, right? Because I like bacon, lettuce, tomato. Um, I like bacon and anything. Uh, it could be a hot dog, right? I got bread, you know, it's bread, it's a bun, it's, it's got meat in the middle. Well, it just depends. It could be a Pop-Tart. Pop-Tart could be a sandwich. I mean, think about it. Structurally, it's similar to a sandwich. It's got layers of stuff with stuff in the middle. And that brings us to the sandwich alignment chart, which I find is a great, <laughs> a great discussion point as to why we get bogged down in specific definitions. Like, it has to have this, 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 and this. And if it doesn't have those things, you know what? Guess what? You're not. If it doesn't have bread and meat in the middle, it's not a sandwich. Well, it just depends on your point of view. You could be a structural purist. Like it has to have that structure. It has to have two slabs of something between. So a chip buddy, which um, it sounds very British to me. Like I put French fries and ketchup inside of bread. That sounds good. But then also we look at the ice cream between two waffles as a sandwich. If I'm a structural purist, that's, that's a sandwich to me. If I'm a structural rebel, hey, look, a burrito is a sandwich, right? At the end of the day, we eat all of these things with our hands, you know, and the outcome is I've filled my stomach with something that looks probably not very nutritious. But it's saying, at the same time, we see this in technology too, where we get bogged down in the concepts and definitions, like it has to be this, it has to be that. But all a customer actually ever wants is an outcome to meet their needs. Get your pictures in. It's on the Twitters. I got it on the Twitters. Um, if we look at HCI, theoretically, or realistically, we can go back to the very beginning, you know, like 2012, 2013, when SimpliVity and Nutanix were kind of the, the two players, and we had scale computing to a lesser extent, was focused lower on the lower end. Um, really, is it easy to buy? It, is it consumed in a simple, you know, pay-as-you-go type of expansion or economics? Can I consolidate management and my maintenance and life cycle into a single pane of glass? Um, is it easy to get up and running in an hour, the day zero experience? Does it abstract away the complexity of management from a day-to-day -day aspect across the compute, the storage, and the memory pieces, right? I mean, at the end of the day, if I look at that original stack of infrastructure, what was it? Commodity x86 systems, running Linux. And for those of us who started playing with virtualization in the early 2000s, 
We spend an entire decade virtualizing pretty much every Windows server and Linux server in our data, data centers, but we never thought to virtualize the actual appliances that they were running on. So that's all HCI ends up being, almost a packaging exercise to consolidate that infrastructure to give you a more cloud-like consumption model or dynamic. Um, <clears throat> there are three common approaches. Hey, you know? Gabe. Yeah. How would you, what would you, how do you draw the distinction between CI and HCI? CI, for the most part, has been taking best of breed disparate solutions and putting them together. So if I look at a VBlock and if I look at a FlexPod, I have Cisco UCS, I have Cisco Networking. Wouldn't, wouldn't all those statements there apply to CI? No. No, I mean, it's simple to set up. I used to have a picture of a V block being pushed through a ceiling because it wasn't it was too big to fit through the door and you couldn't just go couldn't, you couldn't go assemble the V block in your data center and I could walk over and I could slide an HCI solution into the rack right I don't I still don't see as, as CI is simple to set up because well, you have to go through quite a bit of work flex set up it comes set up, but the amount of work that has to go into that coming in, in there is, As is a significant. Customer, I don't care how much work the vendor has to do before the product hits my loading. The point. vendor does. Yeah. Can the customer set up a V block themselves or a FlexPod themselves? So you said FlexPod, the yes. The vendor decides block. if it's HEI or CI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it can. Well, actually, yes. But, but see, you know, realistically, when I look at it, when I look at traditional converged infrastructure, right, it's a little heavier, it's a little more tightly aligned, it's a little more restrictive, you know, the, the, the HCLs are restrictive to a certain part, the patch management is restricted to a certain part. If I haven't sat down and gone through all these permutational changes to make sure that that patch doesn't break or bork something down the road, that's the difference, right? Whereas Traditionally, if we look at HCI solutions, they're a little more software defined, they're a little more self-user pro provisionable, they're, you know, they're, there's not, you not have to worry so much about so many disparate parts being put together because everything is a simple, same common chassis. So I have one motherboard to, to work against. I have one set of firmware to work against instead of the firmware for a switch, the firmware for a storage array, the firmware for a UCS chassis. Yeah, you do, you have the same concerns. I mean, it, most high- I can... don't, to the extent that I only have one package to apply that to, not three different packages that I don't build all myself. Yeah, but in terms of the preparation work, you still have to do the same. It, again, it's no different to CI. The, the channel vendor or the vendor themselves would, would take care of that. So as far as customers concerned, the benefits are the same. I mean, I guess I could see that point, but I think the market is actually determining where the route of this consumption goes, right? CI, 5%, 4% growth rate, HCI, about 70% compound annual growth rate. Customers like the smaller form factor of HCI. <clears throat> I think they, they look at it from a standpoint of, it's something I could work on and I could build. I don't know enough people, traditional VM admins, that think that they could go out and build and put together a V-block if they had to themselves. They look at HCI as, hey, it's just VMware running some software on top to manage the services, to manage the storage layer. I think it's a little bit about being yeah, able to slide and, and in a brick and not have to like schedule somebody to come. Well, that's you know. that's the part Gabe missed on the slide. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's the day it's two the, operations. Well, the, my, the, the slide isn't what is HCI, is, isn't what is the difference between CI and HCI. The no, slide no, but, is what is but, HCI. But a critical piece of HCI is that it's scale out. Right, well it is, yeah, for the and, most part. And CI is almost always scale out. Well, easy to plan and scale. So, I would say scale out is much more easier to plan for and scale HCI at least is, a shared nothing distributed architecture, definitely easier, and they're all scale-out based architectures for the most part, whereas we traditionally see CI not being a scale-out architecture, though the lines blur, right? So if we look at, uh, what do they rebrand scale-IO as, right? You know, that's traditionally a traditional scale-out type of solution. Yeah, you know, we're seeing that market change. I honestly think that there's gonna come a point in time where the vendors who actually build these solutions are going to have a common management plane and you're just gonna choose the hardware package that you deploy on, right? I want my mega deployer. Mega deployer goes out and says, oh, are you an HCI type node? Do you have storage inside you? Are you a distributed system where you're compute and storage? Are you vendor X, Y, and Z? And I know you have defined characteristics and I can identify those and package it and deliver it. That's what I would like to see. The, the blurring the lines between the, you know, the small scale and the rack scale implementations with the common 
software defined structure that sits underneath it, right? Because if I have to do this across three different storage operating systems, I've already failed. I need to have a single storage operating system or a single package of infrastructure that I can use where the APIs are the same across all of those, where the, you know, the, the geometry or the characteristics of the performance are the same across. Matt? So, so I think that the, the key here is that words mean things and that you know, the, the phrase hyper-converged is just another buzzword for, uh, for the industry. That's what our industry does well. We get something and then we say, we can do it better, we're going to call it a hyper. And, and then everybody, <laughs> everybody jumps onto this bandwagon right. and calls themselves Mega. software defined X, Y, Z right. or hyper I think I think what we should focus on, because you said it and I've been hearing it a lot, and I've been hearing it a lot of conferences, the outcome. Let's the focus outcome. on the outcome. I, I don't really care if you call it hyper-converged, if you call it converged. I, I think the customer is most concerned with what, how is this going to help me right. in my business challenges and how am I going to get the best outcome that you talk about possible? Does so, this solve the problem that I Exactly. I and, I don't, and as a customer, I don't think they care if it's hyper, super hyper, or mega hyper. Well, the problem is, you know, you've got, uh, and in the reseller community, we see this all the time, the users want what they hear they want. And they don't pay attention to the differentiations <clears throat> between platforms, which is really the meat of what we're here to The do. nuance, so the differentiation between platforms, let's talk about that, right? Because you have these three common approaches. I can take hypervisor, right, commodity. You know, I got a VMware, I got KVM, I got Hyper-V. I can take a hypervisor, I can put it on some bare metal, and I can build a controller VM. So the storage functions are really what we're, is the crux of what the foundation is for any HCI solution. If we look at every single one of them, yes, there are other layers on top of it, but if you don't have a robust file system that can scale out to meet the needs and great, it, uh, it pushes in data services, you're kind of limited, right? So we take bare metal, we get some switches, we put the hypervisor on there, we put the storage controller in a controller virtual machine that eats up a little resources, and everybody's gonna tell you, hey, you got plenty of CPU and memory on those boxes anyway. Right, and then what do I do? I put on a simple installation routine, okay? How do I package this together? That's the packaging exercise. And then I put on some kind of consolidated management platform. And that's my package, that's what I'm delivering, right? This is what every HCI vendor has done. And for the most part, this is probably the fastest route to market because you don't have to develop your own hypervisor. All you have to do is build an installation routine and a management routine and have a strong storage foundation. And there's a little bit more to it than that, but realistically, that's what we're looking at. If I look at the next integration, it's hypervisor and storage combined on bare metal. Okay, so that's um, scale computing. Right? They have a KVM and distro where their storage is integrated into the kernel. That's VMware, vSAN, VxRail, the entire vSAN ready node architecture and infrastructure solutions that exist today. Right? So I put my storage functions into bare metal, into the kernel. I don't have a controller virtual machine. This affords me, um, one, it locks out my competition to some extent, right? Because I'm not going to open up my kernel to everybody unless we're going to do pure open source. But if you're doing pure open source, the limitation is going to be, well, maybe your customers don't really know how to manage the hypervisor that you put forward. Right, the, uh, you know, the, the KVM versus VMware argument, I tend to solve that one by saying, go put a job ad out for a KVM administrator and put a job ad out for a VMware administrator and you'll get 20 resumes and you'll get one. And you'll probably have to pay that one guy what you pay the 20 people because that set of expertise is a little bit different. That may be an exaggeration, maybe 3X. Um, we still get the same thing though. We get the storage pieces in there. We build the simple installation routine and we have a consolidated management room. That's one approach to HCI. A little bit longer, a little more defined to the actual hypervisor. And then there's this choice. And we don't have as many com you know, companies doing this right yet. It's really NetApp and I would say Daytrim does to a certain extent as well. We take storage and we take hypervisor, we put them on bare metal, we still do the simple installation routine, we still put them into consolidated management, the packaging there, the outcome is still a full stack of virtualization with all the bits and pieces you need to get up and running. All three of these outcomes do the exact same thing. We package a full stack, turn it on, get it up and running, and then the customer starts to deploy VMs. Now, the okay. value add you put on top of these things is what differentiates you. Question. So um, 
that's all well and good for sort of day zero deployments, but when you get to you know day two or whatever, where you're, you're thinking of, I need to upgrade my hypervisor. Mm -hmm. With this sort of architecture, do you not need to make sure that, and that the storage is in lockstep and falls into that compatibility whilst the, the it, other two? That's one of those, it depends, Yeah. right? So realistically, let's say I have to patch the hypervisor. If the patch has nothing to do with the storage subsystem being leveraged, so let's say it's a VUM update for, you know, um, Spectre. You know, a kernel patch or a Spectre or something like that, where I'm focused on the CPU itself. Obviously, we have to go back and validate that. We don't have a specific distro. There's no special VIBs. You know, it's not, it's, it's, you're just going to download, the, or actually, it comes with the bits for VMware on there, but you're just going to run standard VMware. Nothing changes. It's no different than if you are put it on an actual regular just Joe server that you bought. Right? And you would have to be concerned about the compute characteristics and how they interface. Now, on the back end of the storage side, you have to make sure that the storage can service that up. So you may see things where it's like, all right, well, does this particular patch have anything to do with um, you know, plugins? Or does it have anything to do with vCenter to a certain extent? That's where you would have to qualify it and break it out. There's a lot of benefit to that kind of one and all, all, all in one, single point, single point and click patch management piece, but I also think there are some benefits to having disparate patch management platforms, even if you still orchestrate them in a single, single point and click type of, yeah, of manner. The orchestration. Right, because if I don't have to update my storage, why would I? If I don't have to touch the storage piece, why would I do it? Right, doesn't, I mean, I, yeah, I think you're injecting a lot more risk into updating an entire suite of technologies than just point solutions that are just patch releases. How often when you had a multi-tiered architecture, were you looking at a VUM patch and going, oh, well, my storage array going to work? You probably weren't, unless it was touching something like an HBA or an, a NIC to a certain extent. And that's where the longer tail comes into validation. Obviously, everybody wants to stay as closely in lockstep with the hypervisor providers as possible, right? But lifecycle management is one of those things that is the biggest bugaboo inside any converged or hyperconverged solution. It's, it's one of the reasons people go towards HCI because they think that it's, it's going to streamline and simplify that operational aspect. Um, when we look at the benefits, uh, you know, and here's my super Venn diagram on this, the, the controller VM approach, it gets used to these things, right? It's time to market, man. I can get that thing up and running pretty quickly. You know, 18 months is usually the norm. Um, it gives me a low entry point, right? I can come out with a 2U, three node solution, you know, in a really low form factor, I'm sharing cores, maybe I'm running five or six virtual machines, that robo, that super edge type use case, definitely affords from this, it's easier to use that way. I can definitely get multi-hypervisor support a little quicker, right? Because all I'm really focused on is that controller VM and the storage systems and making sure that we can orchestrate in the back end, the development time for that's faster to go from hypervisor to hypervisor. And for everybody, you're getting that easy to buy, simple to install, consolidated management platform. That's the crux of you know, the, the base part of HCI. If I look at the bare metal on the hypervisor, or the, you know, what's, what's getting me that, that in-kernel solution, well, now I'm getting closer to bare metal performance. Right? Maybe my overhead is 5 to 10%, maybe 15%, depending on the type of data services I'm turning on, whereas the controller VM one, I've seen it go as high as 30 or 40% of resources off each individual box. Not bad when I'm starting small, but if I have 100 of them, and I'm taking up 30% of the resources as overhead, the TCO on that doesn't look so hot, right? Um, I get a lot deeper hypervisor integrations if I go this route. And obviously it's regulated to the actual hypervisor owner, right? So there's only a few companies that actually get to go down this path. Because it's not like we open up the kernel to everybody if I'm VMware or, or Hyper-V. KVM, you can kind of roll your own, but you know, I think the last thing the world needs is another fork hey, KVM. Yeah. Seems like, um Let's say I'm not going to talk about the competition, but the solution that's deployed as a VM yes. right, seems to have fairly sizable, scalable uh, configurations out in the field. I mean, they're fairly large. In fact, larger than the hypervisor-based one, from my perspective. So, I, and it's not and if if the storage as a VM is high overhead, mm -hmm. you'd think that would kill them. So I'm always curious when when that comes up, right? Because I want to look at that implementation and I want to kind of drill down a little bit into it. Because realistically. Let's look at the market, 82% is VMware. What is our limitation there? It's 64 nodes because that's what VMware will scale to. Do people normally deploy 64 node clusters? No. Usually the bulk, the max one I will see is 32 nodes. And if we look at 
the way these systems are designed, architected, and managed, usually we have a manager of managers, right? So I'll have some kind of master control plane that manages the silos of different resources I'm implemented, but I'm abstracting away the complexity of taking a siloed approach to applications because maybe I don't do mixed workloads real great. But I'm not seeing a thousand node cluster running KVM. At least I've not run into one yet. We all know, I mean, I know, you know what, I I'm should probably- I'm not a thousand node cluster running of that either, but you know. <laughs> or maybe even a hundred. node clusters or beyond are configured, you know, available today and running in, in customer environments, right? Right. And they're not, they're not limited to I'm 50 not, or- So 100. I've seen, I've talked to, I mean, I've talked to a lot of customers. I've yet to talk to one that has more than, more than 60 nodes of anything deployed in a single instance. Hmm. I mean, you probably get to speak to a lot more customers than I do, at Maybe least speak to that, that will open up the kimono to you, right? Because they're not necessarily always going to do it to me because I'm trying to sell them something. Yeah. But I know that some of the bigger Nutanix customers, you know, the ones that have thousands of nodes, it's not a thousand node configuration. It's lots of Multiple, little silos. 60 nodes, yeah. 100 nodes. 16 nodes, you know, maybe it's 32, right? And, and I think that that's coming. I look at the SimpliVity ones. I mean, I don't think that scale is really great. And I'm not, it's not FUD timer here, but I think that realistically, if I look at the H, this is another part of this. If I look at the HCI market and the mindset and the marketing that's been done to them, it's the sub 20 hosts and below customer that they're really focused on. Because I'm not seeing HCI adopted in my hyperscaler data center or in my super large enterprise. You know, if I look at like the big financials, they're not interested in this yet. They think well, of it they as are an edge for, technology. For point solutions, right? As an, for, an edge solution, a branch in a box. But I go back and I look at the number of flex pods that are deployed. That's, that's the area. They want the risk aversion is, is there. They know they have a solidified solution. They know it's been up and running for 10 plus years in production environments. There's 115 different validated designs for a flex pod that they can choose from type of thing. We're still de developing some of that stuff on the HCI front. So I'm not saying it can't do it. What I'm saying is that customers are still averse to making it the de facto mode of consumption in the data center. I think we're starting to see that shift a little bit, but I also think it boils down to some of the limitations of the architectures themselves. By the way, you also mentioned um, that, that offload for the storage plane, but you didn't mention the third option, and that's the hardware offload that SimpliVity is doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think that, I think they're actually getting to the point where they don't have to do it. Um, there's, there's going to be overhead. Well, there's no free lunch. Exactly. Right? right. So, the question so either is, you dedicate can... those resources, you accelerate those resources, or you cannibalize your resources. I think that's a fair assessment, Gabe. Right. Uh, I also believe, though, that, um, and, and while they are moving away from the Omni card, I still think that particularly at the time it was released, mm -hmm. and may not necessarily be quite so valid today, uh, it was a very interesting approach towards moving that outbound. I was there. <laughs> you were, I know. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, the thing is, is I always looked at the, the OmniCube accelerator is, is hardware accelerated storage, hardware accelerated mm -hmm. solution. And you know what, it worked really good. I mean, but if you look at, if you look at the way the metadata is treated, the way they, in the back end object piece of it, you know, they needed that, right? Because if I tried to put that all into the CPUs, I mean, you think about that FPGA, it's, a, it's basically a little server that sits inside mm -hmm. the server. And so, you, you know, it, it would have been too much. Though. It's, it's not your CPU, it's not. Yeah, but the system doesn't work without it. That or won't until. Right. Until, right. I mean. Like, like any other basic FPGA offload in the storage world? It's good for about five years, and then two generations of Xeons come around, and you don't need it anymore. Or, when, yeah, you're getting close to that way. came around, came out, and the standard processor was four cores, that FPGA then you could run hey, a lot look, more look at Look, look at the storage. Yeah. 22 core processor, I don't care. And Howard's right here. And look at the number of storage solutions that now that we have specific, you know, now that we have Optane, we no longer need NVRAM cards, right? As long as we can persist that storage in the, in the, uh, in the NVMe you know, technologies or the technologies that exist out yeah, there, the, right? The other problem with the FPGA for SimpliVity is they could never run it as an AMI so that you could access the data. Actually, you states. could. They, they used to, I mean, I remember that they, they delivered it, not to have the, the big SimpliVity party here, but you know, um, you know they, they did have an AMI instance, it just was prohibitively expensive. So, um, moving along. Now, if we look at this independent compute and storage piece, um, 
What it affords me is flexibility and scale. And in our case, we, we decided to bring enterprise class storage. If you look at the NetApp HCI product, it's based on Element software, which was the solid fire technology that had been in production for seven years, powering very robust um, cloud solutions, software as a service type offerings, very cloud focused, multi tenancy, mixed workloads, guaranteed performance, scale out technology. That was characteristics that are, are, you know, basically a lot of the times I would position that technology as if I wanted to do block storage as a service with cloud-like consumption dynamics and guarantee SLAs, that's the technology I wanted to leverage. And if it was going to grow and I was going to onboard and provide new services, and if automation was a key focal point to my delivery mechanism, that's where it worked. So we took that technology and put it in this because it was a shared nothing type model. It was very fit the same type of architectural designs that the other solutions had as well. So your limitation is in the hypervisor? No. It's not that the limitations in the hypervisor, the limitation for us is that this model doesn't give you a nice super low entry point, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't give you the same breadth of feature integration at the hypervisor level unless we built our own. Like I said, probably not going to do that. Um, it does give us the ability to support multiple hypervisors and even bare metal workloads. It's not like I have to run ESX on our compute pieces. I can run any, any commodity operating system on top of there. Now, the packaging exercise to deliver that as a cohesive turnkey solution, that gets elongated a little bit, right? Um, and then you start to have to expand the breadth of your, you know, uh, the number of patches, and that can get unwieldy, right? So that's kind of like one of those case-by-case -case things. Yeah, you want to run an Oracle Rack on this? Yeah, you could. Let's submit a, submit a product request, and we'll talk to you about it. But I think it opens up the door to a lot more flexibility, whereas if I'm in kernel, I'm only doing hypervisor-based workloads. If I'm a controller VM-based solution, I need a hypervisor to work on, right? What does my container strategy look like then? So Gabe, how do you get to the point where you're simple to install and consolidate management when you're running Oracle Rack and Hyper-V and VMware all in the same environment? I mean, it's a different That's Well, that's some holy game, grail right? stuff there, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, that, you know, <laughs> yes, getting you to that point, stuff. there are trade-offs, right? So yeah. I can trade simplicity for sophistication if I need it, right? But I'm also affording the customer the choice to make that decision or not. I'm not forcing them down one path or the other. So, I mean, today there was some discussion about um, deploying Kubernetes over uh, independent compute and storage solutions. Is that, is that on a, a hypervisor solution based? It, it is right now. Okay. The target focus of that is to do it on top of a hypervisor. It's interesting, you know, so we, we have a, uh, uh, they announced it, but there's a Red Hat OpenShift uh, validated design that runs on top of our, our HCI solution. And the discussions with Red Hat was that 50% of their customers were running OpenShift on top of VMware. So it was naturally a good fit. It blew my mind too, right? I'm like, yeah, 50, they told us 50%. So, I mean, I'm taking that at face value, but uh, you know. It doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me either because I think if you look at a lot of enterprises, they're risk averse. They don't have the expertise in hand normally to necessarily spin up the more esoteric or more exotic well, you know, we'll, hypervisors. We'll take it to the and, next step, right? Zen server and Zen desktop are 98% deployed on VMware right now. Right. Not yeah. the bare metal. <laughs> right, Citrix, I mean, I know he's deploys. Uh, until I moved off of, of, of individual servers and virtualized my environment, my Citrix servers were all known on individual servers, then they all moved to my VMware farm, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, and I think that's common. It, it affords customers the chance to start to make their dip, dip their toe into the space that's probably uncommon to them, right? Because if I really think about it, you know, my traditional you know, VMware admin, you know, they're learning the Kubernetes space just as well as everybody else is because they're not developers, right? And they're not used to or accustomed to leveraging those types of tools. They're not building multi-factor 12 or 12 factor applications with microservice based architectures. They're keeping the lights on and providing pipe power and a set of resources for those people to run things on top of. And to your point earlier, let's not get dog bogged down in definitions. Our customers simply want an outcome. You're welcome so, for that, by the way. <laughs> um, you read my mind. <laughs> I'm fair. We, we, I, I, here's your five dollars. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I very lead Was it 1980? <laughs> <laughs> We're independent analysts. We're not worth that shit. <laughs> um, so, uh, kind of get into what we're doing, right? Um, 
I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Obviously, NetApp has kind of broken itself into three distinct groups. You know, we have a group that's focused on modernizing architecture, right? So we have, you know, all of the fast technologies, our NVMe over fabric tech, that traditional ONTAP based storage structure, and a huge number of customers that love that stuff, right? 25 years of history that we've focused on, and we believe that cloud connected flash helps customers in the longer run, right? Um, if I talk with Anthony Lai, and who was on the stage today, showing you all the cool stuff that he's building with StackPoint, with Green Cloud, with all the cloud volumes, cloud insights, all the cloud, cloud, clouds. Um, they are trying to inspire and work with the hyperscalers to build services that customers can use that have enterprise characteristics. Great, yes, I know Google, I know Microsoft, and I know uh, AWS could all build their own NFS file system as a service and have but is it gonna have the same set of enterprise class features that our customers are accustomed to in the enterprise? Probably not, right away, maybe over time. But things like guaranteeing performance, you know, clones and snapshots, you know, we, 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 we created that industry, we created that market space. And there's a lot of value, especially when we start to look at the applications they may want to lift and shift into public cloud. And then there's us, my people. <laughs> um, Cloud infrastructure business unit, we're really focused on how do we build, how do we help customers build and accelerate their journey into public, pu private cloud? And how do we end up becoming kind of a landing point for the cloud data services that we're putting into Amazon? Why shouldn't I be able to take those services and drop them on prem and use them there as well? That's where we're trying to talk more about hybrid cloud infrastructure instead of hyper converged infrastructure. I think the market as a whole, personal opinion, is shifting way more away from that simple packaging exercise of consolidating storage, compute, and virtualization into a box. And it has to move way further up the stack and get deeper integrated so that I can make this transition between the public cloud space and the things I absolutely have to control on-prem. Because I am still seeing customers pull out of the public cloud back home. Right? And I think there'll be a battle that happens for, a, for the foreseeable future where people are saying, does it make sense to put it up there? I may have started to design it up there, but you know what, I wanna control it at home. Maybe the cost dynamic's better, right? Not everything will go to public cloud as much as they may want it. And not always, and, and then we're seeing a weird shift too where public cloud is trying to come into the data center. Look at Snowball Edge. I'm running EC2 instances on a Snowball box. They floated the rumor about Google. Obviously Azure Stack definitely tries to make that bridge. So, you know, it's the battle for the hearts and minds. Hey, Gabe. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you'll find this out about me as we <laughs> go on, but uh, you, you kind of, you made a statement and you kind of just left me hanging. And I, I think for those that are listening, um, us around the table, we may know this, but you said cloud connected flash helps customers in the long run, and then you stop. So how does it help the customers? I think people that are probably watching this would like to know the end of that storyline. That's, that's the bigger push into what we call data fabric. It's a big, a big, more of a elongated discussion and strategy. But if I look at it from the standpoint of, if I have flash-based solutions, and let's be realistic, I don't want to sell spinning disks anymore, right? Just economically, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, at least in my viewpoint. And there's certain places for it in the object space and some others that I think it's more relevant. But realistically, people are building storage, they're putting flash in the data center, right? So for us, it's part of that data fabric piece where I can take something like you know, snap mirror and snap mirror to cloud on tap or snap mirror to cloud volumes or have the data protection pieces built into that so that there's awareness. When you saw Anthony's demo today, he was going through there and looking across the, the three different regions, but he was also looking on-prem mm -hmm. and he was finding flash-based on tap solutions and an HCI-based solution as targets that he could work with. And that's what we're talking about when it comes to cloud connected flash, is how do we integrate the on-prem piece into the public cloud if we're so looking to do that? How do I go to cloud.netapp.com as a management portal for my data storage infrastructure across multiple locations, whether it's cloud or whether it's on-prem? So it's kind of a, a new operational model to get there. That's, that's, my, that's my cloud connected flash story. Okay. Greg probably has a different one. And then, um, sorry. New rule, you can tell me to shut up if I ask you questions. But you <laughs> no, no, the said, questions are good. You also said lift and shift in the public cloud, and that, that to me is, um, that, that just screams uh, pain and suffering Yes. for a, for a customer. 
Uh, there's an energy company in, uh, in New Jersey that was sold a bill of goods saying they would save 63% if they put everything up into uh, the cloud. I won't say which, which cloud. Yeah. But uh, they found out that their expenses went up by 38% because, number one, they didn't have the skill set of people to support the new tools in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Number two, a lift and shift model was not going to be successful for them uh, because there was, these were not cloud-ready apps. So um, when I heard you say that you, know, you want to talk to customers about a lift and shift strategy to the public cloud, that kind of I put want, me on edge a little bit. Well, what I want to do is I want to understand if they think that that's a viable opportunity or not. Right, there's a little deeper conversation. Okay. Fact, refactoring of applications to be worked, to be effectively leveraged and utilized in the public cloud space is a whole nother world. Yes, right? it is. And but I, I mean, when, I hear, when, I hear, when I hear a vendor say, use that statement though, I, I, I want to make sure that we double click on that a little bit more. <laughs> well, you know. It, because it, it, I know that's not what you mean. Right, right. I, and I think that's, you know, obviously we have an hour here, so it's like I can't dive into it. And I'm trying to go off a specific uh, set of talking points. But realistically, we look at it, right? It's taking a much more cons uh, consultative approach to engaging with the customer and understanding that every CIO that's, that exists has gone to some conference like this, heard a bunch of gobbledygook, brought it back home and said, we're doing this tomorrow. And then all the IT people were like, holy shit. Yeah. Clever. And then, you know, and then the reality sets in and then it becomes kind of this hybrid monster baby, right? You know, um, I used to have a slide in one of my presentations that had a picture that, it had a tweet that Adrian Cockcroft had put out. And it said, the AWS bill for Netflix was 700 million line items. It was 2,800 applications across 80 zones. I went and did the math. If you actually printed that out, it would circle the earth because it fits 54 lines per page. It was something like 54,000 pages if you printed the whole thing out. I'm like, yeah, you could print your bill and circle the planet. Please don't. <laughs> Save a tree or a forest. So anyway, well, wait, we digress. But that kind of goes back into customer focuses for us, right? Hey, Gabe. Yeah. So. Um you made something. You mentioned that your your your. I think your ultimate goal with with uh, your build cloud to accelerate new services is to have all your cloud services be available on HCI. Is that you see? I, I, I can't do that really, today. The thing is, I, I'm going to start to. The thing is, if I can put it in the public cloud, I should also be able to run it locally. Are you going to run cloud volumes on your HCI? Yeah. Why not? Are you going to run cloud sync on your HCI? Well, maybe not cloud sync. <laughs> That's a little bit of a different animal, but I like, mean, oh, should I look at this way? Look at the let's look at the on tap running on your HCI. Is that I can only run the on tap on my does. HCI. There's a clip. There's a button inside the NetApp deployment engine that basically says, "Would you like file services?" It builds an on tap select instance, provisions it, builds the storage piece of it. The and file services is not necessarily all there is to on tap. No. So everything that you can do in on tap select, you can do on HCI. Well, no, so everything you can do on ONTAP, you can do on ONTAP Select, except for two things, Worm and Snap Vault. Those are the only two functions. And we're not going to basically serve out you know, iSCSI and Fiber Channel ones. Obviously, we can't do that from there. It's file, it's NFS based. I'm right? very disappointed there's no Fiber Channel. I am too. You know, I've had three conversations Perfect. this week about people going to Fiber Channel for HCI, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> anyway, but no, getting back to it, so obviously there's work that has to be done, right? And now if I think, if I put on my really future vision hat, why can't we containerize these services? I have a platform that will run containers. I have some technology that we bought when we acquired GreenCloud that does software or service Boy, delivery man. engine. Yeah. I just bought a com Kubernetes service company for orchestration, and I can take Istio and Helm and all these other solutions and put them together. Now I, have a, uh, now I can start building a application catalog. I can start looking at this more than just, hey, I can deploy a hypervisor and some VMs. Okay, maybe before you jump to your next slide, sorry yeah. to keep you on that slide. No, it's but, okay. Uh, to build on what um, Ray was saying before, one of the things I'm seeing in, in the enterprise world is that organizations are extremely siloed, yeah. and most of the time, HCI is just seen as, you know, we're going to get these, I'd say, what I've seen the sweet spot is around 10 to 12 nodes. And usually you put that at manufacturing sites, remote locations. And the problem I see the most of the time is a kind of waste where if 
file services are somehow run by another division, mm -hmm. another organization. Backups are run by another organization. So you spoke about data consolidation. How do you? It's the that biggest challenge we face in this particular part of the of the. Uh, of this technology space, right? Is how do I go to a silo-based organization and tell them all, learn cross-functionality? Now, um, uh, the story I tell is, you know, I worked at Toshiba for a number of years before I, I went to the vendor side. Uh, one of the guys I worked with, Bruce, he was the AS400 AS operator. Um, you know, I got a notice on LinkedIn like two years ago that Bruce was retiring, and I called him and said, hey, well, what's going on? He's like, well, they uh, shut down the AS400, okay? Now, I'm not saying that you know, everybody's an AS400 operator, but he had ample time to learn new skills. And, and that's a hard one, man. Go, going out there and telling people you have to learn something new and different because the operational models are shifting away is a tough pill to swallow. But people who are putting 90% of their stuff cloud native don't care. So to be on that, I, one of my customers runs one of these VM-based uh, hyperconverged solutions. Yeah. And one of the things we run into is when you have, and we use NetApp for uh, file services. File services, yeah. And obviously at small sites, you get to a point where you start thinking if it's economical to, to have a physical appliance versus a virtual appliance. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to kind of maybe see if you're going to speak about that, how you kind of consolidated the service. That hybrid, HCI. there's kind of like the Franken HCI, right? Yeah. And it, it moves beyond what HCI is, but that's part of our flexibility and scale message. Mm -hmm. I can run a certain amount of file services running on tap select, and it makes sense, but there's going to come a point where I want a little more consistency of performance. Maybe the footprint needs to expand a little bit bigger. Why don't I hang an A200 off or A7? I mean, we've architected solutions where HCI is the management plane and the application delivery vehicle. There's a piece of that, which is the element software storage piece, but then I've hung two petabytes of FAS off the side of it, right? And, and that's, that's listening to the customer because there is no one size fits all solution. That's a hard thing for a lot of- It is the, a hard- the, cure, the true- C classic, we'll call it HCI. Right. Well, you've broken, you've broken the model, or now you're not HCI at all. I'm like, well, they don't even have a, a connectivity methodology for a lot of those. Well, you know, another thing for us is having the open storage model, right? So, at the end of the day, I have this really awesome performant element software-based storage underlay. If I'm not using that all for the VMs that sit on top of that as compute nodes, and maybe I will run around some bare metal Kubernetes or bare metal Oracle or anything like that, it's an ice guzzy target connect to it, turn it on, give it a QoS profile, and provision storage and use it, right? We're not gonna let those resources sit and strand. You can consume those resources any means you want. And, and that also solves an issue that I see in a lot of these solutions, which is if you run out of storage, you have to buy an entirely well, additional cluster. You have to buy another, so th that's the trap of the controller VM process, okay. right? There's a, two, a couple things. One, overhead resource utilization, which is higher than normal, but the second is, boy, all I wanted was five terabytes of storage and I had to buy two sockets of VMware, oh, and God forbid I put Oracle on there and it's 54,000 bucks a socket. Now that is five terabytes of storage just turned into $120,000 in licensing. Right. That's an extreme example. but. Think about it. How many things do we license by the socket or the core? Yeah, but that, that, I mean, that's all a licensing issue, not a technology issue. It's a technology issue if I force you to scale your compute and storage at the same time every no, time it's you a scale. No, it's, it's a licensing issue if the HCI vendor who publishes that storage via NFS to the hypervisor doesn't let me attach another server via NFS. That's Correct. not a technology problem, that's a licensing problem. But it is, it not, many, not many customers, not many of the solutions that exist out there today allow that, right? So they actually, Oh, no, no, they all... The, they say they will. All, all the major players have this licensing problem and, right. and take your money. But it's not that the technology is broken, it's that the vendors are greedy. 15 minutes, wow. God, I mean, I need to accelerate. You guys are just pepper me the questions. Let me jump, okay? Because I want to I show you some other stuff. I mean. I can, I can go through this really quickly, right? So we want to bring enterprise expertise to cloud provider know-how to public cloud partnerships into this platform and space, right? That's really what we're trying to solve here with the HCI product. Um, if I look at it, there are two consumption models. We have the traditional all-flash array type model, and we have the HCI, which is the all-flash array packaged with compute. But I can intermix these two solutions and provision them through the same mechanism. 
If I want the different geometry that comes in the one new Trident storage node, it's 12 drives, 100,000 IOPS, much more dense, there's nothing to stop me from connecting it to that compute and ha have that be the storage resource that powers it, right? Same operating system, same APIs, it's the same solution. There's no difference between the, other than the form factor that it sits on. And this is markety stuff, but we'll keep going. Like I said, <laughs> scale as you grow. I mean, I can show you, we can do a product pitch some other time. But, you know, the thing is, not like you scale out, you can scale in. And I think that that's important. And it's a living ecosystem. The system, the, the, the first solid fire node that ever shipped can run today's current version. Right? If you want to get 10 years out of your hardware, you can try and do it. It may not run nearly as effective or efficient as the new stuff. It may not be nowhere near as dense. It probably has 240 gig SSDs in it, right? where the new ones have 1.9 or 3.8 terabyte drives in them. Faster, more efficient. I can replace you know, five or six old solid fire nodes with one node. That's the kind of operational approach we're looking to go forward with. So, architectural vision. Um, I'm gonna shoot past this because I wanna to get to kind of like our vision or where we're looking at, right? Obviously we wanna focus on this concept of simplification of core IT, that's HCI 101, that's consolidating storage, compute, virtualization, and networking into a box, and tra tackling your traditional you know, VDI workload, your, your, your uh, development, your enterprise services, right? Um, Tackling the new challenges is how do I look at the container ecosystem that exists out there today? How do I take a more DevOps focused approach? How do I look at services that I'm putting in the public cloud space and how do I bring those down? So that's integrating with cloud, that's also accelerating new services. For us, Gabe, one yeah. question. Um, you were, you showed uh, pictures of uh, the appliances you have? Yeah. That's all NetApp? All NetApp? Yeah. NetApp it, design infrastructure, yes. So, um, to Who's work the underlying with other vendors as well, right? Yeah. Is there something coming up where I can buy Fujitsu or Lenovo? Or? Yeah, so right now, obviously, you know, we've always had this concept of it's, it's a software defined product, right? I mean, there's, uh, it runs on, if I look at all of the solutions that we've qualified element software on, there's about six different hardware platforms. Okay, for us, the opportunity has to be there and the partnership has to be there for us to flip this to another manufacturer in terms of that relationship. So if I was gonna go to Fujitsu and build a NetApp Fujitsu branded HCI solution, I would have to go through the qualification effort to do so. Now, if a customer comes and says, I have $100 million for you if you do this, well, obviously I'm going to do that, right? <laughs> but I'm not just gonna do it to do it. Because all I'm injecting then is additional HCL to work with, you know, um, more complexity. I got to dedicate engineers to the life cycle that, you know how long the life cycle is? It's about it six to 10 long. years. So it's a bunch of extra work and maybe five people want it. Demand will drive that decision, mm -hmm. right? If somebody wanted it on, you know, uh, on, on Cisco or Dell or HP, obviously, you know, that's a tricky relationship. Right, but you do what the customer wants, and if that's if it's in their best interest to do so, we will investigate and evaluate that. I can't say today that it's going to happen. Right now, I look at it from, you know, we've got Supermicro, we've got Quanta, we've got Dell, and we've got Cisco as solutions that we've worked with in the past. Obviously, NetApp is a in the business to make revenue, and there are some relationships that are more uh, lucrative than others. <laughs> and then there's some layer eight issues around. How do you tiptoe around alliances and things like that? But that's well above my pay grade. <laughs> um, these are the kind of three, like I said, looking at those three solutions, how they integrate. Obviously, we want to continue to tighten up, you know, that route to market, right? Hey, when we came to market, small, medium, and large compute nodes, small, medium, large storage nodes, that might have worked for the beginning, but it obviously doesn't work long term. So we have to get towards a config to order type implementation. We have to expand our compute config options. If you, are, if you go on the floor today, we have two, two nodes on the floor today. We have a GPU accelerated 2U node for graphics intensive workloads, and we have the new Triton nodes that are there. We're gonna continue to expand. We're moving into Skylake. We'll move to Icy Lake. We'll get onto NetApp or into Intel's cadence in terms of the delivery vehicle. 
which is interesting because now it looks like the Intel's moving to 12 months, which will be really interesting because I look at a lot of really large customers who take six months to validate the last design that came through, right? So they'll always be behind, but that's, you know, that's a logistical challenge. Obviously, we want to continue to work on validated solutions. So we have the NetApp validated design for VMware Private Cloud. We're working with VMware on the VMware validated aspect of that. We also have that OpenShift platform that runs on top of this as well as a validated design. Those are almost baked and ready to go, right? We want to build solutions that sit on top of this. I look at the large ecosystem of solutions that exist for FlexPod, and I think those make sense where they do make sense based on the, um, the, the storage profile to put onto the HCI solution. We have a really pretty, uh, fairly robust roadmap to address solutions in this space. Okay, one thing I don't see on the solution, uh, there's no AI appliance, NVIDIA yeah. kind of thing here. And, and so realistically, you know, so obviously we have this partnership with NVIDIA, and you've seen all the AI work that uh, Santosh and his group have done, and I think that they're better suited for that right now in terms of a data play. For us in the HCI space, we're just now starting to evaluate what it would look like from a, you know, a partnership and what type of cards we would have to put on there and what that market really realistically looks like from a total addressable market. It is the, the hardest thing I've found in working with product management and engineering teams right now is to identify the TAM that exists and have real solid numbers that aren't just made up. And that's, that's a struggle for everybody. It's like, oh, so AI is really hot right now. Okay, so do we go dedicate a million dollars to building an AI platform and then get out there and sell four of them? And we've seen that across every vendor's struggles with that challenge. Well, I'll tell you, every vendor's talking about outcomes. One of the ways you're gonna get there, faster than everybody else, is through AI. Right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Watson is powering our active IQ platform. I'm just gonna go ask him later. Um, but yes. It's definitely something that's at the forefront, especially as our partnership with NVIDIA continues to expand. Obviously, you have DGX in that space, so it's a little bit of a competition. Um, I, do have a, I do have a customer and a couple of SEs that were thinking around the lines of, well, can we use the GPUs for VDI during the day for people when they log on Monday you know, from 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock and then flip around at night and turn those on and use them for ML or AI? And I'm like, that makes sense to me, but are those cards good for that? Is it just going to allow me to dip my toe in it, or am I actually going to get some utilization? Or do I turn into a Bitcoin miner? <laughs> Probably not, because it's too late for that, if right? You could. Um, the second point around uh, accelerating the new services, obviously getting to a flexible entry point. You know, the solution's a little heavier today, so we want to get down to that 2U model. That's two storage nodes, two compute nodes, and two virtual nodes. We are kind of cannibalizing the concept of the controller virtual machine, but it's serving as a storage witness. But the thing is, we wanted to be able to do that and not sacrifice any of our core, uh, core claims, right? I still want to be able to give you guaranteed performance. I still want to be able to scale the solution. I still want to have all the API integrations. If I can't do what I've always done for my regular storage customers, or my regular HCI customers, then I'm gonna to struggle to kind of introduce a smaller footprint of entry. But it's something we're definitely focused on. Can you run that by me again? It's two storage nodes? It's two physical storage nodes, two physical witness. compute nodes, and two virtual witnesses. Two virtual witnesses. Right, because you know, we wanna have, we always kind of like the four. And that's just entry, right? So Say again? If you scale up, it's just. If I scale entry. up, then I can get rid of it. The realistically, we get a lot of customers <laughs> who are like, I'm looking for that edge device. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? And then obviously, if I do that edge device and I decide, well, God, this is the best thing since sliced bread, I need to be able to scale it. So I need to be able to seamlessly integrate into that, that one and depreciate those virtual nodes and put the physical ones in there and scale the resources that way. Um, and the problem. Obviously, advanced workloads. So that's addressing your AI ML pieces there. That's where we're kind of looking at that one. Um, and are we a good fit for it? And then I look at things like SAP HANA and things of that nature where certification with the vendor of, of record is, a, is, a, is the, probably the bigger challenge, right? So you've heard, you know, SAP's got uh, um, Nutanix and vSAN on their, their HCL now for production. Now, if you look at those, you have to dive into the details because they're fairly limited in scope, but the reality is, is there's nothing that really would stop us from doing that outside of making sure that we are blessed. So there's a program for that, right? Same thing with things like Epic and things of that nature. The thing stopping us from Epic, well, they want Fiber Channel. And nobody's doing Fiber Channel on HCI, right? Good. No, they're doing HCI because they want to get rid of their Fiber Channel. <laughs> but are they um, token rank? Good, though. 
They're not doing fiber channel over token ring either. Um, obviously, containers as a service, you probably hear something about the NetApp Kubernetes service being uh, talked about today. That's from the Stack.io. I've never seen, this is the first for me, we bought somebody five weeks ago and we already have working prototypes. That's pretty impressive. I think it went live the day it was announced. You could get it on AWS. I, I can't pay attention to everything that's out there. <laughs> it already runs on AWS, Google, and Azure. Now, does it run on my HCI system? Yes. So, productization is coming. Hypervisor choice is VMware KVM while you're doing Azure uh, on the other end, so why not Hyper-V? Good question. Good question. Good question. I think, I, honestly, I don't, I don't see enough Hyper-V. Mm -hmm. I also look at the way Hyper-V is, is architected and I see Microsoft's bigger push to have, to have to leverage storage spaces. And, and, and I would skip Hyper-V and I would go to Azure Stack, but then that's, like I said, if I go that route, I've just minimized all of my storage efficiencies, and it's just not a good fit for a storage array manufacturing solution. Be, it's good for be. DAS on, bare, on white box or you know, bare metal. You might be US centric in that perspective. That's possibly true. I mean, I still look at the market share numbers, are we at five or 8%? I still get people ask for it. You know what? I've approved a bunch of feature requests for people who want to run Hyper-V on this platform, right? But I'm not, in the, I'm not in the mindset right now to make the investment to package Hyper-V and build all the SMS integrations and all of the other things that need to happen to where I can integrate into their management plane. Now, if I build in a completely separate management plane at some point down the road, Azure Stack might be a landing point for me. But like I said, there's a lot of engineering that has to go into that. And if I look at the lion's share of the market that we're probably trying to address, it tends to be VMware and KVM based. And, uh, at the and, and we're talking, we're not talking, we're not doing a cropless, right? The last thing the world needs is another fork of KVM. <laughs> no, really? Why not? <laughs> cropless <laughs> on NetApp <laughs> HCI. <laughs> you could make people at it's Nutanix's head sincere. explode what? if you did that. Hey, we do all Please do that. Mind blown. <laughs> so, and on the container side, it's Kubernetes only? Yeah. For now, that's where we're making the investment. I mean, I, I, that's where I see the market obviously oh, going. Absolutely. Hey, yeah. if I go back to Red Hat oh, Summit absolutely. in Atlanta in 2014, the, the, the Docker presentation was standing room only and people outside the door. Now, fast forward not even four years, yep. this market can change on you know, really quickly. Yeah, absolutely. You're not worried about bare metal. It's it's Linux on the compute oh. nodes and I mean, I just think there's more money to be made in selling services than t-shirts and stickers. And it's all API driven. <laughs> Anyway, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's why I said. Getting this to be the on-prem piece of, you know, the things we're doing in Cloud Central, bringing those services down onto the HCI as your local infrastructure piece, right? So I have zones in the public cloud space, and I have my on-prem zone. And any services that I'm putting up there, for the most part, I'm not saying all, but many of them that I'm putting up there, I want to be able to run locally. And then when my people are doing development work, and I can take a container and move it between two places. We already do data management really well from on-prem to into the cloud and back. Now we can take the workloads along with it. So it's, it's getting more full stackish in its approach. Just because you can do something doesn't mean Just you because should. you can do so something doesn't mean you should, that's correct. But like I said, flexibility and choice is a key hallmark to this. And we see that there's always gonna be a need or always gonna be a desire to a certain extent to run stuff at home. And if I'm building services, and if I'm building applications that rely on those services in the public cloud space, it would be pretty cool to extend those same services down into my local data center so that I'm not having to rewrite the wheel every time I make a car. That's a horrible analogy. There's more to... <laughs> rewrite the wheel. There we go, you can quote there's more me on to that. those workload services that are running in the cloud than, than, sorry to say, just data, obviously. I mean, right. lots of infrastructure ma management, there's lots of uh, different applications that run there. You expect to move some of that down to HCI as well? Yeah. I mean, if we look at it, HCI becomes a region within Cloud Central. We can deploy, migrate, manage, um, uh, scale container based applications. You know, this is the architecture that we would like to talk to you about, orchestrate services. It's beyond, hey, I can go take a look at the different services that exist there, right? Okay. I can pick whichever one I want. I go on board, I take a look, I'm like, oh, hey, I want this. All right, pick my cloud provider. Okay, let's get started. Let's extend into the application market space as well. 
because I want to tie those applications that exist there. I want to tie specific servers or services that exist up there into these packages that I'm working for. Because if I start to do this work in the public cloud, and if I can't replicate it back locally, then I've wasted a lot of time and effort. So how these are awesome. will other cloud providers be uh, integrated into this? So. Well, we have the big three right now. Yeah, I know, Ollie, but there's Rexbase, there's... I talk know, with all kinds of people. Right now, I think I have the cycles to work with this one. <laughs> um, productizing it for other people, is, I mean, nothing's off the table. So you're going to replicate the entire cloud application marketplace to run on ECI? Just to containerize apps. It's, 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 this is vision. Vision. Right. Okay. Okay. I, I I can't replicate the entire ecosystem that exists there, but there's nothing that stops me from dragging an app down. As long as it's a container, yeah. As Can long as it's a container or a VM. Can we go serverless HCI? I don't know yet. Because <laughs> I still have a server. <laughs> when so, is uh, when is Storage Grid going to be available on HCI? Um, I could put it on there today. I haven't productized it the same way I do uh, 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 on Tap Select yet. Put, trust me, I, like my, my decision to, I mean, there's a lot of things I would like to do. I would like to have a NetApp services catalog that's, you know, when I spin it up, like choose this, 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 and this. There are some economics behind that as well. I mean, we have to look at it as, yeah, when I'm building object storage, you know, 1.9 terabyte no. flash drives are probably not my target audience, right? So we have to get a little more creative there.